Howdy. All right, I'm going to review a couple of vocab terms that you should know from last unit. And then today we're gonna to jump into nomenclature. I'm sorry I can't be here for you, so you gotta work with me. Follow all the notes, take all the notes that I'm writing. I'll go slow for you. And then ask me questions tomorrow or the next day in class. This is a very, very, very important concept. So it's gonna kind of drive how we talk throughout the rest of the year. So if you don't understand what I'm saying when I say potassium permanganate, then you're gonna have issues. So work with me and I'll help you understand how to start naming compounds. All right, so first of all, we all should know valence electrons are the outer electrons that are gonna be reacting. So they're reactive electrons in outer shell or outer energy level. So we need to know that they're in the outermost energy level. Cations are positively charged. So how do they get this way? They have lost electrons. Anions are negatively charged. How did they get this way? They've actually gained electrons. Those are terms that we already know. The octet rule, we've maybe talked about the term octet or having noble gas electron configuration, but we haven't actually talked about the rule. This unit, we're gonna talk about the octet rule being something that is one, uh, all atoms want to attain octet in their valence electron shell. So eight electrons wanted in electron, or I'm uh, sorry, energy level, their valence energy level. This is gonna allow them to act like a noble gas and, and seem to be like a noble gas, which is the most stable arrangement of electrons. Isotopes, this is one that we need to talk a little bit more about. We need to make sure that we know that every single atom in the world is an isotope. It's an isotope of a, a type of element. So everything is an isotope, except atoms can differ by their neutron count, so by number of neutrons. That's the only thing that makes atoms different. That's gonna be atoms of the same element, of course, though. All right, so we also need to remember some of the laws that we've, we've described before, but we haven't actually defined what the law of definite proportions is versus the law of multiple proportions. So the law of definite proportions is where uh, scientists used to believe that two elements, when they combined, there was only one way in which they could combine. There was a definite proportion in which they combine, a definite ratio, if that helps you understand that a little bit better. So, for example, there's only one way that C and O can combine. Maybe they said it was just CO. That was the definite proportion. But we know that is currently not true today because actually there are multiple ways that atoms or atoms of certain elements can combine. And that's why we have a law called multiple proportions, aka multiple ratios. So this means that atoms of carbon and oxygen can actually combine C, C and O, or, so this is in a one-to-one -one mole ratio, or in a ratio of C1O2. So this would be a one-to-two ratio. Knowing that, there's mul multiple examples, such as the one listed here. For water, we know that water is H2O, and in the H2O category here, it's a two-to-one ratio. For peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, that formula is H2O2, and so H and O exist in a 2 to 2 ratio. It's just telling us that there are multiple ratios possible for any given elements. All right, so let's start the naming process. So we need to talk about some of the background information, such as what do symbols look like, and then the terminology we use when we talk about things that are ionically bound together, or covalently bound together. So nomenclature just means naming stuff. All right, so we all know the symbols. You're gonna find those on the PTOE. They differ. Sometimes they start with a letter, like let's say phosphorus starts with a P, but potassium starts with a K. So we gotta make sure we're cognizant of that. So this right here would be sodium, and this right here would be chlorine. So just making sure you can read and find the symbol. For elements, if we're talking about individual elements, then we would call this an atom of sodium. We call this an atom of chlorine. It's just the proper use of the term atom. When we start combining compounds or elements together, we're gonna make compounds. And then we now have a formula. The formula represents a compound, which is two or more elements together. We learned that back in unit one. So this first one is called sodium chloride. That's something that I'm sure you are all familiar with. The second one here is called carbon 
dioxide. If you remember that or if you know that, then you are halfway there. Your nomenclature skills are going to be awesome. Okay, but there are two differences here. The first compound is actually an ionic compound, so that I means ionic. And when it's ionic, we call this formula a formula unit. So if it's ionically bound together, we call it a formula unit, and that's just a little bit more specific than what, in what we're talking about. If it's a covalent compound, such as carbon dioxide, I know that this is covalent. I'll help you determine that shortly here. If it's covalent, we call it a molecule. And I abbreviate molecule M-O-L or E apostrophe C. So we need to have those distinguishing terms to indicate what kind of compound we're talking about. Equations are easy. They're just addition of two things or two compounds or two elements together. You're going to have element or compound plus element or compound yields. So remember that this means yields to some product. And the product will vary depending on what or how things react. That one's pretty simple. We'll do, deal with that for our next unit. All right, this is a lot. I will let you copy some of this down. I will talk really slow. And I'll pause the video to let you guys copy some of this down. But most of it actually is fairly familiar. So the two types of compounds I just mentioned are ionic compounds and covalent compounds. These are characteristics that go with those two different types of compounds. So we already talked about the formula unit. We abbreviate it like this. Check. We've got that one. We also should know or need to know that ionic bonds are strong. They are very strong. Therefore, since they are so strong, it takes a lot of heat to actually cause some sort of ionic compound to melt. So if you've ever tried to melt sodium chloride, aka table salt, it's not going to happen. There's no way that you're going to be able to get something, some, some stove or a Bunsen burner hot enough to melt it because it melts at a very, very high temperature. Another term we need to know is electrolytic. This kind of sounds like electrolysis or electricity. That means that when you finally do melt something, when you finally get something molten, which is just melted salt, some sort of salt compound, an ionic compound is any ionic compound is actually called a salt compound. Once you finally get it to melt, it will conduct electricity. Electrolytic means conduct electricity. This could be a good thing if we want it to, but for example, if you're swimming in the ocean, and the ocean does have some sort of ionic compound, some salt compounds in it, then a lightning strike hits down in the ocean, that's a really bad idea because now we're talking about an aqueous solution which is this second term here, aqueous solution, and that is also going to be able to, be able to conduct electricity, which would be obviously bad for your health at this point. So they only conduct electricity in their molten state or, con or in their aqueous state, not solid state. Know that. Because their solid state, their ions are locked in position, they can't move, no electricity is going to be passed from ion to ion to ion to ion, therefore it's non-conductive in its solid state. Speaking of solid state, everyone should know that they're solid at room temperature. That's what RT means. Another thing is, what is it? What does a salt crystal look like? It looks like a crystal. It looks kind of boxy. It's got shiny edges. If you hold it, it's hard and, and it's a solid. We call that a strict, a crystalline structure. You need to know that as well. Usually, they are also brittle. This means they cleave. Easy. So if you took a hammer and you and you hammered a piece of a big salt block, it should particulate, it should cleave off easily. That does not mean the bonds are not strong. That just means whenever you put two salt pieces together, they are actually are easily broken apart. The bond is actually what's holding the ions together, not holding the salt block together. Secondly, down here with soluble in water, that means it will dissolve. That's what the term soluble means. And everyone should know the uh, de definition of ionic bond is that they donate electrons. Electrons are transferred in order to make the bond occur. And the bond is not truly a, a, a sharing bond where things are being held together. It's more of an electrostatic attraction. A-T-T-R-N means attraction. Electrostatic attraction. I'll help you understand that a little bit more when I show you some demos tomorrow. 
All right, the next category, covalent. Covalent compounds are pretty much opposite of, of our ionic compounds. These are going to have nonmetals only within the compound. So that's what NM and NM means. Nonmetal, nonmetal. One thing I did not mention in the ionic compounds is that they have a metal, a metal, and a nonmetal involved. So they're different because metals and nonmetals form cations and anions, whereas covalent compounds do not form ions at all. No charges, no ions, they don't conduct electricity, they have low melting points. Pretty much everything is opposite. So you can see that here. We have molecules, not formula units, so we don't call them anything but molecules. We have low melting points, so think of butter, I think it's the best example. Obviously that can melt in your hand, chocolate can melt in your hand. It's because the, uh, the bonds, I'll say the bonds between, are not strong. Lastly, down here, we have non-electrolytic, so that's also the opposite. And then a volatile, volatile means that it easily vaporizes. So if you put perfume on today or deodorant on today, and we can smell your aromas, your, your, your I don't know, sweet pea or your raspberry perfume, it's because it's a covalent compound that vaporizes really easily. So we actually take advantage of that for things that make us smell nice. Last thing is the definition of a covalent compound. So that's called sharing electrons. In ionic, you donate. In covalent, you share. And when you share, there's actually going to be a physical bond. So this little line here is a bond. There's a physical bond between multiple atoms together. So the bond is going to be allowing the octet rule to be followed. All right, hopefully we are good there. We'll come back if we need to. Okay, so when we write a chemical formula, it's going to help us learn a couple of things about that compound. So these are the things it tells us, and you don't have to write this down, but make sure you understand this. So first of all, it's going to tell us the types of elements. So I can see there's an S and there's an O in this compound example here. When I look at this, and I'm going to now recognize that this is a nonmetal compound, sulfur is a nonmetal, and oxygen is a nonmetal. Automatically, right off the bat, I can tell you it is covalent. If I see two nonmetals together, then I know that the way it's bonded is covalent. Then I can tell you all kinds of properties about it. I can tell you it's not electrolytic, it's got a low melting point, it's volatile, all those things on the previous page. Some more things that this tells you is, are the numbers of atoms. So there's one sulfur and there's three oxygens because of the subscripts. The subscripts are the numbers that are the lower uh, underneath kind of the, the letter. And that's going to let you see how many of each of the atoms are present in that compound. All right, so let's practice. Look at the following compounds and tell me which ones are electrolytic. Usually when I look at something like this, the first thing I say are, which ones are ionic? So this is a compound, this is a, co a characteristic of something ionic. Okay, this volatile nature means it evaporates, it evaporates easier. It's something that is a covalent characteristic and probably soluble. That means dissolves, if you don't remember what that means. That is going to be also an ionic characteristic. So, which of these are ionic? Here's our job. Let's look and see which ones are metals and nonmetals together. Metals are on the left-hand side of the periodic table. The nonmetals are on the upper right. Looking here, I see metal, nonmetal. So that's ionic. The next one, I see nonmetal, nonmetal. So I know that one is covalent. The next one I see metal, nonmetal, that's ionic. And then if, let's take you a second and let you guys do the last three. All right, hopefully you had a chance to look at this. This potassium here is a metal, fluorine is a nonmetal. So therefore, that's ionic. Two fluoride ions here, two fluorine. So that's nonmetal, nonmetal still. That's covalent. And lastly, we have this example here. Oxygen is a nonmetal, and fluorine is a nonmetal, and that is going to be covalent. So, which of the following compounds are ionic? Those are the ones that are electrolytic. That would be the first one, the third one, the fourth one, and that's it. 
That's also true for the probably soluble category, the third bullet down. Which ones are volatile or the ones that are covalent? That would be the second example. And the fifth and sixth examples, those are the ones that are covalent. So pretty much you need to be able to identify which ones are ionic and covalent and the properties that go with those. Okay, let's get into a little more detail. You need to have your PTOE out and you need to make sure you have the PTOE with the list of polyatomic ions with it. These are things that we're gonna start recognizing um, and identifying when we start to do a little bit more naming. So polyatomic ion sheet. There are some that we need to start memorizing, which is uh, pretty much all of them. There are some trends here though. So have your sheet out. I'm gonna start telling you some of the patterns that you should make sure you have some information about. All right, so let's break this down first. Poly, poly means many. Atomic means atoms. And ions means they have a charge. They can be a positive charge or a negative charge. It just depends on what we're talking about. So if you're looking on your polyatomic ion sheet, you're gonna see lots and lots of atoms coming together. For example, you'll see ClO3, one minus. So that's ClO3, one minus. That's name is chlorate. That is the chlorate ion. It's a polyatomic because there's a chlorine, three oxygens, so multiple atoms together, and there's a charge. There's another one that looks really similar to that called ClO2, one minus. That one is called chlor Eight ion. We can see that this ending of eight and eight are the only thing that's changed here, as well as the oxygen dropping down from three to two. That happens a lot. So if we look at another example, uh, SO4, two minus, versus the compound SO3, two minus, the name of this first one is called sulfate ion. The second one is called sulfite ion. So yet again, as you go from the first compound to the second compound, or ion here, and you drop an O off, so you go from four to three, it goes from sulfate to sulfite. This ca continually happens. So let's look at some more. You know, three, one minus, is nitrate. You know, two, one minus, is nitrite. So there's a pattern here. What I recommend is that first you memorize the ones that all have the eight ending. So that would be sulfate up here. That would be nitrate here. That would be chlorate here. Memorize those and then just remember, drop an O off and then you get chlor, you get the ite version of that. And one of the goofy ways that one of my students last year remembered it was Whenever you um, change, well, well, we'll talk about the, the, the funky way later, actually. Let's hold off on that. All right, there are two more with the chlorate series, though. If you drop one more oxygen off, so it's one, one minus, that's actually called hypo chlorite. It's one that the hypo actually means below. So you go below one more. There's no more ending to the suffix, instead the prefix changes. And the last one for the chlorate series is CLO or one minus, and that one's called per chlorate. So this one is one above, so this one's plus one oxygen, and this is minus one oxygen. Therefore, the end, sorry, the prefix changes in this case. The per is added to the top, and the hypo is added to the bottom. Those are probably the hardest ones to memorize, so keep working with those, and ask me questions. We're using them a lot today in lecture. And here's what I pretty much just told you. One extra thing that you need to know though is whenever you have ammonium, that polyatomic is the only one that's a cation, the positively charged one. That's NH4 plus, it's a cation. So this is the thing that you need to know. The EM ending is, the, is very rare. There's only two polyatomic ions that have it. This is called ammonium and this OH1 minus is called hydroxide, a hydroxide, which is this one down here. Hydronium, sorry, is H3O plus. We don't see this one too often, so this one's rare for now. The hydroxide one is right here. So we have the EM ending, and now we have the I ending. Hydroxide is OH1 minus, and then cyanide is CN1 minus. So there's a lot to look at, so start practicing now. It'll make your life a little bit easier when you start doing your problem sets. Two more terms that are kind of... Uh, 
oddballs is the term by prefix. This is prefix by and prefix bio. If you ever see bisulfate, something like this. Bisulfate means there's an H in front of the ion that is called sulfate. We already saw the ion sulfate was SO4, 2 minus. When you put an H in the front, it's actually an H plus. They come together to make H SO4, 1 minus. Thio is very similar. We'll go over that one in more detail later. Okay, so when we start writing compounds, this is going to take a little bit more work. So you need to know all your charges for, for the representative metals and nonmetals, and then you need to make sure you work with charges when you're working with ionic only. So the first thing you do is you find your symbol and your charge using your polyatomic ion sheet or your PCOE. You have to crisscross charges in every single ionic compound. That means you actually write the charges out like so, sodium chloride, sorry, sorry, sodium with a one plus charge because it's in group 1A, and chloride with a one minus charge because it's in the halogen group, which it gains one electron to become a nimble gas. When you crisscross this one down here and this one down here, so that's a one plus and that's one minus, you just get one and one, which we simply write as NaCl because we ignore the ones. We just don't write them because they look funky there. The next example is does not have a one in one charge. It actually has a two in one charge. So calcium is in group two. So it gets a calcium two plus charge. Chlorine is one away from noble gases, so it gains one electrons, one electron. And when you get the two plus and one minus, you crisscross the charges. And these charges, the, uh, the actual plus and minus never actually travel with the number, we're only really concerned with the number, but you have to write those plus and minuses for me so I know that you know what you're talking about. So whenever you crisscross this here, you see that there's a CA with a one and there's a CL with a two. But that one, again, looks kind of funny, so we just write it CACL2. So if I ever give you a name, such as calcium chloride, you're gonna have to write out the symbols with their charges and crisscross them and then you've now written the formula. It's not too bad until you get to use the polyatomic ions. And just as a reminder, charges are based on the valence electrons present. So if you're in group one, you lose one electron, you get a plus one charge. If you're in group two, you lose two electrons, you get a plus two charge. Skip everything in the middle, because uh, valence, there's a different number of valence electrons for every single uh, transition metal in this D block. If we continue, boron's group actually bounces back one, two, three, back to noble gases, so it gets a three plus charge. Carbon's group is a plus or minus four. Nitrogen actually can go forward one, two, three electrons, so that's a three, oops, I'm sorry, three minus charge. Oxygen's group is a two minus charge. Halogen group is a one minus charge. And the hal oh, sorry, the uh, noble gases have no charge, zero. That's a review, though, so I'm not going to spend real long on this. It's all about the electron configuration of a, of a noble gas and making sure that the atoms are stable. You got to know who loses electrons and who gains electrons. These are ones that you need to write down and memorize. So I told you that the transition metals have variability in their charges. A lot of them do. These are the most common ones that we deal with. And they have variable charges or one charge that we need to memorize. Zinc, no matter what you think, is always going to be a 2 plus. That one is, just happens that way. It's the most common charge for zinc. Silver is called AG. That's also always a 1 plus charge. You need to know these two are always those those charges. Tin is called SN and that's either a 2 or a 4 plus. Cobalt is either a 2 or a 3 plus. Iron is either a 2 or a 3 plus. And cadmium CD is always a 2. So the ones that I put stars by are actually have a consistent charge that we'll always stick with. 
The other ones, I'm going to have to give you information through the formula, and you'll figure out the charge from that. We'll do some practice with that. But hopefully you're writing those down. One more that I didn't add in the group here is copper. Copper is either a plus one or plus two, two charge. It does not have a set charge. And if you're looking for 10 on your periodic table, it's atomic number 50. And if you're looking for lead on your atomic number on your table, it's lead number 82. And lead also has variability. It's either a plus two or plus four. All right, continuing here, you just need to make sure that you understand that the transition metals are different than most other metals in terms of their charges. All right, let's do a little bit more, more about with transition metals. Okay, so we talked about some of the metals now. Now let's talk about how they are named. They have two different ways of naming them. The first one we're gonna talk about is called the stock system. The second one is the classical system that is really kind of old and we didn't have uh, all the maybe all the pure uh, trends that we normally actually talk about with lead and tin, we talk about more of the Latin phrases that we've used in the past. All right, so since there are variable charges, I need to tell you the charge somehow. The way I tell you the charge is the Roman numeral indicated directly after the name of the metal. So the first one is tin two. That means tin two plus. All metals have a cation. So tin is Sn. Two plus is the charge. Chloride always has a one minus, so whenever you now recognize the name, it's going to be telling you the charge. You've got both of the atoms, you've got their charges, you crisscross their charges, so you get SnCl2. Remember, there's an imaginary one right there after the 10, but we don't write it because it looks funny. The second one is lead 4. This IV, number 5 in Roman numerals, is, is a V, so that's lead 4. Lead's char uh, lead symbol is PV. 4 plus, and sulfide is the other anion, that's going to be a 2 minus, and I know that from the periodic table. So lead 4 plus, S2 minus. When you crisscross those, you're going to come into a problem. You get PB2, S4. That actually is not the lowest uh, empirical formula, which just means the lowest ratio of the atoms. So you need to reduce this by 2. That means lead drops down to 1, and sulfur drops down to 2, giving us lead PBS2. But if you are given this formula here, you need to recognize that the reduction has already taken place. We've already reduced the 2 and the 4 down to 1 and 2, so giving you that formula, you kind of have to think maybe maybe for about a minute before you final, make your final answer to say that it's back here at lead for sulfide. Okay, so we've already done the examples. All right, so Moving on, we've got the classical system. It's fairly similar, except instead of telling you the charge is Roman numeral, it tells you the charge by the way the ending, the suffix of the word ends. So there are two ways of, of ending, os and ik. Okay, so two examples here. Ferris, ferric. Fe is where is what used to be seen when you see ferrous. Fe is iron. You know that by looking at the periodic table. There's a couple of other Latin words that we need to know. Plumbus or plumbic. This kind of looks like PB. That's lead. There's a couple more. Santanus. Let me move this up here. That's SN, which is tin. That's how we got all these uh, the elements because they they were derived from their Latin names. All right. So moving back to the endings here. If I give you two different endings, they're going to indicate the different charges of that that atom. So if I give you os, it's going to be the smaller or the lower of the two charges. If I give you ik, it's the larger of the two charges. I know that lead, excuse me, iron, can either be Fe2+, plus or Fe3+. Plus. Knowing that, when I say os, I'm talking about the Fe2+. Plus. When I say ik, I'm talking about the Fe3+. Plus. Okay, so naming the, the examples here. This first one, fair us, is talking about Fe2 plus. Chloride is a 1 minus, crisscross, to be FeCl2. The second example, since it ends in ic, is talking about the higher of the two charges. 
So that's going to be Fe3 plus, same thing, chloride 1 minus, crisscross those two charges, you get FeCl3. That's the final answer. So if I give you this, FeCl3, and I ask you to go back to the Latin name, you'd have to call it ferric chloride. All right, let's do some practice. You're definitely going to want to have your polyatomic ion sheet out because you need to have the, the list of polyatomic ions for these really weird ending words. So calcium is calcium. That's Ca2+. Oxalate is an ion that you'll need to know. It's C2O4 2 minus. Now, please make a note in that, that you have to put a parentheses around all of your polyatomic um, ions because what happens is whenever you crisscross, you won't know if it's a 2 that's a subscript or if it's a 2 that was a crisscross. You, you just will have a harder time with it. So if you correct, protect your, your polyatomics with parentheses, that's a lot of P's there, protect your polyatomics with parentheses, then you'll have no troubles at all. Okay, so we have the calcium ion and we have the, the oxalate ion. We have our twos that are going to be crisscrossing. See, this two needs to crisscross to the outside of the parentheses, leaving us with Ca2 parentheses, C2O4 parentheses 2. But like earlier, we need to reduce any subscripts down any, in any way we can. Oxalate, the actual oxalate ion, this thing needs to stay as is. But this 2 can reduce down to a 1, and this 2 can reduce down, down to a 1. So it's Ca, parentheses, C2O4. All right, next one is aluminum, permanganate. Al is aluminum. 3 plus is its charge. Permanganate is an ion you'd have to look on your polyatomic ion list for. That is MnO4, 1 minus. I'm going to protect that with parentheses just because it's a polyatomic and I need to stay with that trend, that pattern. Crisscross those charges. They're going, they're going to be put down as, as subscripts here. That leaves us with Al, parentheses, MnO4, parentheses, 3. That is aluminum permanganate. All right, next one, sodium bisulfite. These are kind of difficult, so work with me here. We've got sodium, which is Na+, and this is sulfite. We've already talked about that one, but the bi in the front is telling you that there's an extra H plus that has been added, so that ion is HSO3. It took me a long time to memorize these, so I can do it very quickly now, so it's going to take you just a little practice to really get used to the, all the polyatomic endings and the ways, the different ways we write it. Always protect with parentheses. So crisscross this, and anytime I don't put a number, it's a one. It's very, very common just to put a plus or minus. Okay, crisscross these to the outside, and you get Na, parentheses, HSO3. Now, since both of those are ones there, I'm not going to write them. It looks cleaner to write it this way. All right, next. Uh, there's a type of that in. There's one, just one in. That's magnesium cyanide. So Mg is magnesium, 2 plus is its charge, cyanide is another polyatomic ion, okay? That is Cn1 minus, parentheses around your cyanide. All right, crisscross these, you get Mg, parentheses, Cn, parentheses, this 2 comes down here to make 2 there. That's magnesium cyanide. Next, cobalt hydroxide, excuse me, cobalt 2. When you see the 2, you're actually referring back to the previous um, element, which is cobalt, and that's telling you that's cobalt's charge. That's that whole transition metal Roman numeral stock system of way of writing um, nomenclature out. All right, cobalt is CO. We all know the charge. It's given to us right here is a 2, 2 plus, actually, because it's always cations. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion, OH, 1 minus parentheses around that OH so you don't forget because it's really easy to forget those kinds of things. All right, so crisscross this. That's COOH2. That is cobalt 2 hydroxide. So if I gave you this name, or sorry, sorry, this formula, and I said tell me the name, don't say cobalt hydroxide. You have to tell me the charge because cobalt can be cobalt 2 or cobalt 3. So you have to give me some, some specifics. You have to tell me that it's cobalt 2. That's only for those transition metals. All right, lithium carbide. Here are some things that should be very familiar to you. Whenever you see the ide ending here, ide ending here, ide ending here, you should be thinking that 
That sounds really familiar, such as sodium chloride. We all should know that sodium chloride is NaCl. Done. No polyatomic ion business at all. So this word, both of these here, lithium and carbide, are coming directly from the PTOE. Lithium is obviously Li, lithium. Carbide sounds like carbon. So lithium has a one plus charge. Carbon is going to have a four minus charge. So you'd have to look at your periodic table and notice that you always have a cation and an anion coming together. So you need to make sure that, make sure that carbon is the negative one there. When you crisscross these two, that would be LiC, sorry, so Li4C. That is it. That one looks funny. We don't see that too often. All right, beryllium nitride. This I ending indicates to you that's from the PTOE, as does this one down here. I didn't get to circle that one yet. Okay, so beryllium is BE. When you find it on the PTOE, you'll find that it's in two, the second group. Nitride sounds like nitrogen. So you're going to write nitrogen. And then notice that the charge of nitrogen is a three minus charge. Crisscross those to give you BE3N2. If you're good to keep going, go ahead and finish up the rest of these. If not, I'm going to keep writing the answers and explaining. Aluminum, this is the next one, is aluminum number eight. Aluminum is a three plus charge. Fluoride sounds like fluorine, so find fluorine. It's in the halogen group. That's a one minus charge. Crisscross, that's ALF3. The next one is chromium three oxide. We all should know that the, the three here is referring back to chromium's charge. So that's CR, chromium is a three, so that's a three plus. Oxide sounds like oxygen, that's O two minus. I'm not looking at my polyatomic list right now at all because all of these last ones have been directly from the PTOE. All right, crisscross those two guys and you get CR two O3, that's chromium three oxide. Okay, so there are a couple more here. There are 14. I want you guys to try 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. At least get the ions written out and try to crisscross them. You guys can check with each other or with me tomorrow, but you need to try them out. I'll let you write down anything you need to now and I'll move on. All right, next we have to start naming them. So we've already kind of worked that way. We've already talked about the naming system, but I just want to give you a couple of details that are really, really important here. As you probably saw in your polyatomic ion list, you look at the polyatomic ion, you name it just as is. You don't change the name at all. So if I say cyanide, you write down CN. Just, just don't change the ending at all. The, the cations that we've been working with, like magnesium or calcium or potassium or cesium or vitium, any of those, those names don't change either. Either You just say what you see. So when you see Mg2+, plus or when you see Mg, you just simply say magnesium. Those uh, transition metals, though, you're going to have to look at the charge of the ion and write it down for me if you need to tell me the charge that you're talking about. So if you see SnCl2, you know that that 2 actually came from Sn and that 1 came from fluorine. So if you want to tell me that two plus charge, you have to write it as this, 10 parentheses, Roman numeral two. So that's one thing you gotta make sure you really are cognizant of when you're writing these. Couple more things. You probably saw this trend as well, but when we're talking about an anion, which is the second atom listed, and you have oxygen, for example, you change the ending to ox I, or chlorine to chlor I or fluorine to fluoride. So it's just to makes it sound a little bit better. And when I see the suffix "-ide", I'd, I know that I should be able to find whatever that thing is. I can find it on the PTOE because I'm talking about oxide, which is, or, or chloride, or, or fluoride, whatever it is, um, indicating that it's a monatomic ion. So that's a simple addition. Don't you can write down what you need to here. All right, so when we name these, let's do let's just pick a couple of these for practice. We need to make sure we're in, including everything we need to for the person reading it. 
So looking at this first cation and this anion, let's uncrisscross and see what this what the two and everything belongs to. That two actually belonged to that that anion, and this imaginary one belonged to that cation. So when you're looking at that, you say that looks like a polyatomic ion because there's a an N and an M that H together that is a polyatomic ion. The polyatomic ion thing is ammonium. So you're writing it out, you're not changing any endings. And you see the other one, which I'll erase so you can see a little bit there. You see the other one also is a polyatomic ion. So you need to look on your polyatomic ion sheet, look for the one that looks like that, and that one is called sulfate. Ammonium sulfate is the name of that. No changing any endings. All right, the next one. First thing you see is calcium. Well, that's a monatomic cation. You just say calcium. That's all. The second thing listed here is a polyatomic ion. Look for it on the sheet. You should see phosphate. That name is calcium phosphate. So technically, I think the polyatomic ions are actually kind of easy because you just kind of know the name, no changing of endings, nothing. All right, next one, you see calcium and you see oxygen. No polyatomic ion business at all. So you're just simply going to write out calcium and then you don't write calcium oxygen since this is just a binary. When I say binary, I mean element one and element two. So calcium is the first one, oxygen is the second one. You always have to have an i ending on ones like that. So you're going to write calcium ox i here. All right, let's go down to one that's a little bit more busy, a little more complicated. Number six here. You see calcium again, but then you see this big, huge... Let me fix that. That's just C2O4. You see that big, huge polyatomic ion. You need to know that one. That's oxalate. So this is calcium oxalate. Number seven should throw you on a, on a reminder trip here of the, of the transition metals. So you see copper here. Copper is going to be useful, and you need to indicate to me the charge of copper. The way you do that is that you have to figure out the charge that was distributed when you crisscrossed on this polyatomic ion. So you have to look up this one. So you'd see copper, you don't know the charge of, but this one, Cr2O7, that one has a charge of something that you can actually look on your polyatomic ion list for. When you look it up, that's called dichromate. When you look it up, you'll see that it has a two minus charge. Okay, so that's a known kind of thing that you have to know. However, you don't see a 2 over here after the copper. Therefore, that 2 was reduced down before I wrote the final answer. How did it reduce? Well, there had to have been another 2 over here after the 7. So, meaning that means copper has to be a 2 plus. Because after I crisscross this 2 down here and this 2 down here, and I write the 2 as the subscripts, that means I've reduced them both down to 1. So that's a little bit of a complicated one. However, since you now know copper's charge uh, is actually two, indicated right there, you'd write copper, tell me the charge is two, and then dichromate. Dichromate. So copper two dichromate is the name of that one. Let's do another one similar to that. Transition metal. The next transition metal listed here is number nine. That's iron. And then you see another polyatomic ion, CO3. There's a charge there, but what is it? So let's break it up again. Let's uncrisscross. We have iron, which we don't know the charge of. That's our job. And we have carbon. We have CO3 two minus, or CO3 two minus, which is carbonate. Okay. I know that this right here, this is the only combination of CNO that we have on the polyatomic ion list. So when I look on the list, I see the two minus, and that tells me that, well, there was a two there, because it was crisscrossed down from carbonate. That means there was a two also there, because there had to have been a two on the other ion in order to cancel out or reduce down after you've crisscrossed. So in this case, previously it was Fe two CO three parentheses two but we can't leave it like that because it looks silly. So we have to reduce that down to one and one. So moral of the story here, this name is iron two 
carbonate. Let's do one more similar to that. Number 11 looks good. So number 11 is nickel and chlorine. But nickel we should see as a polyatomic ion. Excuse me, as a transition metal. Sorry about that. Nickel has some charge. We have to indicate that in the name. Chlorine, we all know, has a one minus charge. So how did this two get back here? That means it was crisscrossed from nickel. So I'm gonna revert the crisscross and show you where that two came from. We need nickel was a two plus. So when we name it, we need to indicate that by saying nickel two chloride. Chloride is just a normal old element. And we just change the ending to say I, so I know that you got it directly off the PTOE. All right, you guys have the rest of these. You guys can practice with those. Those are all of the ionic ones. Everything has been crisscrossed. There are charges included if it's a transition, transition metal. And you really should start memorizing your polyatomic ions. Let's shift gears and let's go to something called covalent compounds. I think they are 10 times easier than any of these. So take a breather for a second and let's go to covalent. Okay. Most common covalent compound that all of you guys know, you're breathing it out right now. What is it? It's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. If I told you to write the formula for that, you guys could tell me it was CO2. So, knowing that, how did you know to put the 2 after the O? It's because you told me dioxide. You told me there's two of them. There's a lot of prefixes that you use to indicate the number of, of atoms, which we write as a subscript. Mono means one, di means two, tri means three, tetra means four, penta means five, hexa means six, pepta means seven, octa means eight, nana means nine, deca means 10, dodeca means 12. Those are all geometry terms you are familiar with. So you make the subscripts out of the prefixes as you're looking at a name. So for example, if I gave you sulfur, Pepta, bupepta, fluoride, you'd say, okay, that means sulfur, which is an S. Pepta means seven. That's seven of what? Seven fluoride ions. That means fluoride with a seven. If I said carbon monoxide, you'd say, okay, I know what she means. She means carbon. Mono means one, one what? One oxide, which is one oxygen. So you just put CO. Now, one thing you'll notice is that even though I only have one carbon, I don't put mono out front. Monocarbon monoxide. That just sounds really weird. We would never, ever, ever, ever put mono in front of the compound's name. I never said mono sulfur heptafluoride. That just sounds weird. We do not say if it's mono. Now, that's a point that you need to remember is that don't, I never want you to write mono. But if there's something else, so maybe there was, oh, let's say dinitrogen, pentoxide. That's when you definitely, I put the, the dye there to tell you I need two nitrogen, nitrogens in this compound. You have to tell somebody if you want more than one. One, we just assume is there if you don't put a prefix in front. But if it's dye, you got to tell me. So dinitrogen is two nitrogens. Pentoxide means oxygen with a five. All right, let's do some practice. Carbon dioxide. We all should know carbon dioxide, O2. Carbon monoxide, we just did, CO. Di, phosphorus, pentoxide. Phosphorus, how many of them? Di means two. And then oxygen, how many of them? Pent means five. These are fairly easy. Dinitrogen monoxide. So how many nitrogens? Di, which is two. Oxide, how many of them? One monoxide, so that's one O. You don't have to put the one afterwards. Let's go down one that's maybe a tiny bit more difficult, but really these don't get too much more difficult. Phosphorus pentabromide. Phosphorus just means P, phosphorus. And then penta means five, five of what? Of bromine, Br. All right, so you should, guys should be very comfortable with these. These are simply just reading a, a name and writing the number after it. 
no crisscrossing charges, no ions, no, probably, you could probably do most of this without the periodic table because you should probably know most of these symbols. These should go in about half a second each. You can keep working on them for a couple minutes. They're on your guided notes. Okay, but if I ever give you a formula and I say, give me the, the actual name of it, write it out for me. I did already tell you about the whole, do not put a prefix if it's mono, so no mono stuff. So you're just reverting the process. So let's just do these two examples and then we'll go through a couple more. So this first one right here, you see the first thing is chlorine, you write chlorine. You see the second thing is oxygen, but how many do we have? We have seven of them. Seven is hepta. Hepta oxide. And I don't really, I mean, I understand spelling is kind of important, but this A and this O together, you can just put heptoxide, put a big O there, you put heptoxide. I will not take off. I'm more concerned about you learning chemistry. Okay, so chlorine, heptoxide. Never put the mono in the front there. All right, let's do this one. How many nitrogens? We have three. How do you tell me that? You say tri. Tri nitrogen. And then how many fluorines? There are two. How do you tell me that? You say di. So tri nitrogen, di fluoride. Covalent or easy peasy. Don't overthink it because you can easily mess yourself up, up if you are trying to crisscross charges or do all kinds of nonsense. All right, let's choose a couple of these that we haven't seen yet. Number two looks great. So since it's just sulfur, I'm gonna put sulfur. How many oxygens? There are three, so I say try oxide. Number five looks pretty interesting. Let's do that one. All right, how many arsenic? So AS is arsenic. There are two, so we say di arsenic, penta, or pentoxide. Let's do it that way this time. Pentoxide. We haven't done one with four in it. Let's do that one. Let's do number seven right here. All right, carbon, that's carbon, carbon. How many chlorines? Four of them. So tetra is the name for that, tetra, tetra chloride. All right, hopefully you're getting the swing of that one a little bit. You guys will have to finish those as well. Okay, so there are lecture notes that you've kind of been working with a little bit. There's some examples that we've already done. On your lecture notes at the bottom, there are 34 examples. You can start them now, finish them in class, that would be great, or you can start, start them and just finish them at home. So the lecture notes, you're responsible for finishing all of those. They're ionic and covalent. We've done most of them, you just have to finish them up. But starting on the right-hand side of your little pamp, your, your sheet, it says honors chemistry nomenclature practice, writing formulas, ionic and covalent student practice. These are all mixed up. There's no method to the madness. Some are covalent, some are ionic, some have polyatomic ions, some don't. Try them all. And in the middle, it's gonna give you a column that's a little helpful to help you determine if you're naming a covalent or an ionic compound. The cheat sheet's right here on the board. BI means binary ionic, and that's gonna tell me that binary means there's only two elements, that's it. There's no polyatomic, no polys involved, therefore it should be a simple naming system. Binary M or binary molecular means that you've got some covalent stuff involved, which are nonmetal, nonmetal, but yet again, there's no polyatomic ion involved at all. It should be simple naming. It's the whole prefix, uh, hepta, dodeca, nana, octa, whatever it says. The T1 is the one that has the polyatomic ion involved. T means ternary, ternary means more than two elements. So that might be something like this, NH4, NO3. How many elements are there? One, two, three, four. There's four elements, even though there's two nitrogens. Four elements, that's a lot more than two. So we call that a ternary one. So that's kind of how you're labeling the middle column. All right, if there's any questions, you guys can sell me this the, over the week, or excuse me, over overnight. You can email me. You can work together as long as you are quiet, but please help each other and do not play around. You got this. All right, see you tomorrow.